if we want to be done by 5.15, if we finish earlier, then again keep in mind that you uh, round up your troops because at 6.30 we want to load the buses to go to the fishing village. I hope the vessel will be cooperating. Is that lecture going to be the basis of your next new book called Banksterism? And if not, why not? <laughs> well, most, most of the comparison I already do in chapter 5, I think, of my book. So, my speech today was, for some part, uh, based on this, maybe not the extent, not the analysis of the extent of the Banksterism, but the comparison. Um, on possible future <laughs> research, um, why not? Would be always, of course, always a time time question. Also, it's many things, many things to do, but, but it's not impossible. Uh, just an illusion with these two things going parallel to see 
think that one is the cause of the other. This is an interesting question, in response. I agree with you entirely, I made the same point uh, in, uh, many, many times, um, but I, I'm still I'm astonished by the success, the resilience of the American economy, given, uh, given the incompetence and dishonesty of the government uh, in the way that you described, despite this fact, you know, we have not been like Egypt or like other countries. We have, we have done enormously well with what seems to be an incompetent and in many ways destructive government. Western Europe, the United States, have a bright population. Uh, they even up to this day have a pretty good work ethic still. Look, the Germans continue to work very hard despite the fact that most of the money is siphoned off by countries like Greece uh, and Spain. Um, so it is uh, an expression of the ingenuity of uh, German uh, businessmen, of American businessmen, of Dutch businessmen, uh, and businessmen in many, many other countries that have made these things possible. Markets do miracles. Uh, they find a way around all sorts of obstacles that are put in their place. Nonetheless, those are obstacles, and without them, of course, the performance would have been even much better. Um, but uh, explain the difference in terms of standards of living of Western Europe and the United States as compared to uh, Arab countries and so forth. Uh, I, uh, I'm inclined to believe uh, basically, in the thesis that uh, Richard Lynn put up, this this has something to do, so to speak, with the intellectual capacities and <coughs> capabilities of various populations. Uh, we are lucky that we still have this type of population. Unfortunately, uh, the performance in these areas is also on the decline. I just want to add one interesting thing uh, as a side note. Even in the mainstream literature, it's recognized that the, uh, the gold standard, the classical gold standard, even though it was not a perfect system or it was not the best system possible, in the 19th century, uh, the, the growth, and uh, at the end of the 19th century, growth in the United States was actually higher than it was in the 20th century. And uh, you can even read it in Simon Kuznets, the Keynesian inventor of, of uh, GDP, and then Milton Friedman's history of uh, monetary history of the United States. So two classical mainstream economists uh, demonstrating that actually growth in the, in the 19th century was, was higher uh, under the classical gold standard. And those economists, or, or other economists using data, they, they say that it was less stable environment, but still they have to admit that the growth itself was, was actually higher. Maybe one, one additional note on this. This is even more astonishing given the fact that, of course, it is easier, so to speak, for rich countries to save and invest uh, than it is for, uh, for poor countries to save and invest. So the growth rates were higher despite the fact that it was at that time, given that the general population was poorer, far more difficult to save and invest. And it has become significantly easier now with standards of living being significantly higher, despite the fact uh, savings rates and so forth have actually declined, even though it should be easier to save nowadays than it was 100 years ago. I have a question for Dr. French, and um, I'm not sure whether you understood correctly what we're saying about uh, walking away from the contract. Because if the idea is that you can simply walk away from the contract, my whole concept of uh, Egalitarianism uh, falls apart. So I would like to understand whether what we're saying is that uh, people who have borrowed money in order to buy a house or site and so on, walk away because the lenders are banks that are financed by government and guaranteed by government entities such as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in the United States. And that is the reason why in this particular circumstance people can walk away from the contract or whether you believe that, well, I have pledged to refund or repay a certain amount over a 
certain amount of time, but if the collateral that I gave falls in value, then I'm not going to repair it, whoever is the lender. And I think that there is a, um, uh, I, I know, I'm not a banker and I know nothing about banking, but uh, I think that there is a certain class of loans that are made with uh, mortgage and so on, with a no recourse clause. And that would explain for instance why Morgan Stanley, uh, that you quoted, uh, could have a, uh, could walk away on a five billion dollar deal, as I think you mentioned. Because it's actually not Morgan Stanley who borrowed money, but presumably the subsidiary of Morgan Stanley. And they had the lot of properties and so on that they rented, and the rental income was not sufficient. So the subsidiary went lost, and there was no recourse on the parent company. But a homeowner buys a property. That property is not yielding any revenue. So there is no way that the person can repay unless the repayment comes from their salary. So it is a salary that is pledged. And therefore, if you walk away, you have actually broken your pledge to take some money out of your salary in order to pay back the bank. Well, then I would come back with this. Um, a number of people are um, granted 30-year loans when they're your age or my age. And clearly, that borrower wouldn't have 30 years to repay their loan. They're not going to be here to do that. In, in my view, lenders were playing the market, the real estate market, just like the borrowers were. And so while they want to stand on their high horse and say, you need to pay until the very end, they've taken this loan and sold it, often many times. Um, so. This isn't like you borrowed money from your brother-in-law, not that anybody should ever do that, but who has actually saved money, foregone consumption, to hand and done without the use of that money, to allow you to do something with that money. This is money that, uh, these are loans that originated, sold in the secondary market, um, and, um, so, and in some states, there is not recourse for this. Uh, California being one, I think Arizona is another. Um, and so it varies state by state. There's also other costs to this. I'm not saying that somebody can walk away with and not have costs associated with it. You're going to get chased potentially for decades for the, um, for the difference between what the lender sells it for. Um, and to say, oh, and what you love. So this is not a, um, a walk away scot-free and forget about it situation. The only thing I'm really addressing or trying to address is this moral outrage uh, toward people who, in my view, are making a reasonable economic decision that is the best for their situation. Most people, don't do this lightly. Um, most libertarians would not say that uh, it's ethical to necessarily pay your taxes, but you do. Most people do. But most people lessen the amount of tax uh, that they pay. And yet, um, we're supposed to, at the same time, because we have this contract on a specific mortgage, uh, pay that when it makes no financial sense. So, um, I mean, there's, there's, a, it, again, it's not, to me, it's not an easy decision. I wouldn't tell any individual, I wouldn't advise them whether to do it or not do it. But I just think that the moral outrage against these people, I believe, is misplaced, is the, the point I'm trying to, to get across here, is that, uh, it's a perfectly uh, reasonable financial decision. You pay a price in terms of uh, your credit report, although that's going to lessen over time. 
because it's come out recently, there's been a study done that people who strategically default are actually better credit risks than other people because they use credit responsibly, they underuse their credit cards, and they typically, the other uh, distinguishing feature about these people is they bought their homes recently and they have no personal attachment to them. Many people pay, pay on their homes because they have an irrational personal attachment to that property. So, um, uh, again, it, to me, the, the reason that I explored the issue is that, number one, libertarians had a reasonable argument on either side of it, um, and, um, and very vocal, especially on the, you must pay till the end of time. And I was trying to think, since I didn't have Murray Rothbard down in the hall to go talk to about this, I tried to imagine if I went down to Murray, and said, pose this question to him what he would say. And that's what I was trying to come up with. Could I ask a question to uh, Dr. De Lorenzo about happiness? Um, I think we should take this work on happiness rather more seriously than it was argued in your presentation. Um, these happiness questionnaires are of the general format would you consider yourself to be very happy, fairly happy, not very happy, unhappy? Now that seems a very straightforward question. I don't think any of us here would have any difficulty in answering a question like that and getting a score. And furthermore, the validity of these studies is shown by the results, which are that people who are high earners are happy, low earners are less happy, and the unemployed are particularly unhappy. All that seems very sensible to me, and I think we should take it on board. Um, I think a way to deal with this problem uh, is to consider the implications of this. We see where all this is leading to. It's leading to the conclusion that we should tax high earners more and distribute the proceeds to the poor and the unemployed. And this, that, is, that is the implication of this work. And that is not, a, not an implication which is particularly congenial to people like ourselves. Nevertheless, I think the way to handle it is to point to adverse effects of a high tax, high redistribution policy. Uh, for instance, if you, such a policy encourages high earners to emigrate to tax havens. And uh, such a policy, as far as the unemployed are concerned, of, of, of giving greater welfare benefits to unemployed, encourages them to remain unemployed. <coughs> so I think we should uh, combat this position by drawing attention to the adverse effects of these policies, rather than simply dismissing it all as having no validity. There, there was no question there, was there? There's really a point, yes. Uh, well, the, the, the bad thing about it is they still they use these questionnaires to proclaim that uh, utility is cardinal and measurable. Uh, which is not, and, and then therefore you can make interpersonal utility comparisons. So I think uh, well, we have to uh, argue with that also, because uh, that's that's the main claim that they're making. But I did mention uh, the uh, the effects of the welfare state, which they tend to ignore in this literature. So I would agree with you that that's one way of doing it. But I think it's also important to uh, to argue against these the use the way they use these questionnaires to proclaim that the social welfare maximization is, is a real thing. Social welfare functions exist, uh, which they don't. And, uh, and the Murray Rothbard's criticisms of people who answer questionnaires, I think, are still valid uh, today. So you have to take them with a big grain of salt. And I also believe in ridiculing stupid ideas, too. <laughs> <laughs> Say, say something about the stability of, of this research. I mean, I remember one result was 
that was reported in all papers, uh, all incomes above $73,000 um, uh, uh, um, would no longer make people happy. Now, if, uh, it was in all, in all of the number was 73, I don't, I'm not quite sure about it anymore. But if that were true, then every person who just gets a job offer for 74 would just decline it because he said this additional thousand uh, dollars does not make me any happier anymore. Uh, and uh, it's an easy way to refute this, this whole concept. I have not seen anyone who has done anything like whatever. Somebody wants to offer me more if you want to give me a bigger donation. Uh, was, I will not decline it because it will make me less happy than I was before. Every donation, every dollar, I, I take it. In my case, this whole thing does not apply. <laughs> Uh, psychology, 
these areas uh, are receiving less attention by economists within the mainstream themselves, I would say. From this point of view, maybe there is a link to make with the Austrian school, because the Austrian school is very strong in explaining the, the real world uh, and the real phenomenon which we have been concerned for the last two years. And I think there was one of the major American news, uh, news magazines, Newsweek, and one of them had a cover story uh, It said something like, uh, the failure of the economics profession. Uh, it said something along those lines. And of course, it didn't mean the Austrians. The Austrians weren't included in that. But, but uh, the fact that they were totally clueless about the causes of the, of the, the crash, and then it had nothing to say that was good about you know, what to do about the crash, but the Austrians did, the Austrians were the other ones who predicted that the bubble, uh, especially people associated with the recent institute, like Mark Thornton, and, and then of course what to do about it. And so uh, the mainstream people have paid a lot more attention to the Austrians. And meanwhile, uh, interest in Austrian economics is, is booming. Uh, the, the Mises University, which we hold last year, had the highest attendance ever. They turned a lot of students back even though Doug had knocked down the walls, literally, and they Mises the student building to make room for more, for more people. And the Mises.org website is the seventh or eighth most heavily trafficked economics website in the world. Even more, it's even busier than the White House, Doug, Doug and, the, and the Wall Street Journal, as far as uh, you know, the number of people who read it. And so uh, the Austrians are going in the opposite direction of, of the mainstream. But the mainstream is, is sort of all these, all these tenured professors who don't really care. They're going to keep on writing the same articles to, to pad their resumes. And of course, it was the purpose of these two speeches to put pressure on these people. We see the University of Zurich will now in deep doom after these two speeches directed that they are two most famous <laughs> Another question to Tom and Nikolai. I consider the interdisciplinarity uh, quite important, but the problem seems to be in how kind of misleading or even fraudulent interdisciplinarity where psychology is mistaken for economics. But if, if those researchers actually confined their work to psychology and stop claiming to be economists, uh, would you then consider this kind of psychology as valuable? Would it teach? any valuable lessons about human nature because I find it quite possible that there are certain voluntary decisions which decrease reported happiness. It shouldn't be relevant politically, but from a philosophical point of view it might be quite interesting if relevant to study these phenomena. Well, yeah, but, uh, uh, yeah, utility is not measurable. You can't put a, a, a brain measuring machine on somebody's head and, and then feed them a, a piece of candy and, and see how many noodles are listed on the side of the machine. That, that's sort of the implication of the whole idea that utility is cardinal and measurable, sort of like a Frankenstein monster kind of machine that you put on our brains do that. As long as you understand that, I was just talking to a, one of the physicians in the group uh, earlier about how he questioned his patients uh, uh, on uh, how much pain are you experiencing. Scale of you know my, one of my doctors does the same thing uh, as a biology doctor and I just not make up a number I have no idea what he wants me to say about that as long as you understand that this is not really that scientific I suppose it could be useful but it's, it's subjective and uh, and, and you know there, there are all, one of the critiques of this too is there are different cultures uh, you know there might be one culture where people are sort of not uh, inclined to say I'm unhappy about anything. There might be another culture somewhere else in the world would be just the opposite. And, and they pretend that they're always happy despite being unhappy. And so you, uh, that's what Rothbard meant when he said you can't really rely on the truthfulness of questionnaires. You have to observe people's actual behavior. And as long as you understand those things and take with a grain of salt, I suppose it could be useful outside of economics. Just, just the, the same way if you read opinion polls and this and that, yeah. somehow it might be more or less entertaining to know what these people think about that issue. So if you find out that uh, unemployed people tend to be less, uh, less happy than employed people, it's not exactly a surprising, uh, surprising result. If I look here, the opposite, because that uh, unemployed people uh, are actually uh, far happier than people who make a billion dollars. That would surprise 
surprise me. But, but then there are quite a few surprising results. Yeah, but, but again, if you take it just as an information of what they have said to certain question, yeah. But the entire purpose of this having is research is of course to find excuses for economic intervention um, and to, to, to ultimately to see destruction of uh, all private property rights. Yeah, I take your point that uh, it would make sense to have this entire psychology and economics field reviewed by psychologists also. Uh, my feeling there is that uh, psychologists will also find it quite doubtful. Uh, psychology is not necessarily accepting also this empiricist and positivistic approach, so that will be already a first problem. problem. And then the interdisciplinarity indeed makes sense, but only if uh, the different disciplines are properly acknowledged. Uh, it doesn't make sense if you melt two disciplines into a single one, losing what the goal of your research is. By the way, in the Property and Freedom Society um, statement of purpose, uh, it is not said that the, the goal is multidisciplinary research, it's transdisciplinary research, fully acknowledging uh, the, the status of uh, different sciences, different social sciences. Uh, my question is for Dr. French. Uh, do you think uh, whether it has nothing to do with whether it's moral or not for a person choosing to walk away from a low platform from a dome, but rather he just choose to consume now versus getting easier credit in the future. And so my next question is about the non-recourse nature of mortgage uh, in the US because I, I don't know whether I'm I'm right or not, but uh, I think it's quite unique uh, for uh, the U.S. that the mortgage is on the course. Then, whereas in other jurisdictions, like for example, like Hong Kong, you cannot just walk away from the loan because you need to sign a personal guarantee when you buy a flat, something like that. So, what do you think is the is the cause of that non course nature? What was the first question again? But, well, because you said the ethics of default, but is it uh, is there anything to do with ethics? Because it's just a person. I mean, he choose if I walk away from the dorm, but I don't have any consequence. So of course I would walk away from that. Like for example, if I'm 18 years old and I walk away from the dorm, no problem. But if I were 20 years old, I walk away from my home, then I, you know, the rest of my life, maybe I am very difficult to get credit. So, yeah, just my question is whether it's an ethical issue or not. Well, I, I framed it in that, that context. Uh, or, or certainly, the, uh, certainly the person who uh, gave me the title of the speech did. But um, I would put it more as an uh, individual business decision. Um, and you're right, if, if you're a young person who's concerned about future credit um, and how this will weigh on, um, on your credit report, your future job prospects, those kind of things where um, uh, possibly a strategic default will have a detrimental effect on your future, then, then maybe that decision certainly is going to be different. Um, but if you're 200, say $200,000 uh, uh, underwater, and uh, you're paying four thousand dollar house payments, and uh, the house will never recapture that negative equity, and um, you can have the same house, same neighborhood, and either rent or buy, and have a have a payment of fifteen hundred dollars. I mean, we're talking about significant numbers. We're talking about significant lifestyle uh, choices here. Nobody's going to walk away for 200 bucks, 300 bucks, 400 bucks. Um, what I'm talking about here is something very significant where people are weighing, okay, my credit report, I've got perfect credit at 720 beacon, I'm going to go down to 530, uh, which is, is going to be very uncreditworthy. It may take me seven years to get back. Uh, Fannie Mae is not going to do another mortgage if they've determined a new strategic default for seven years. So there's a heavy price to pay. 
Um, but potentially, a lot of people probably need to get out of the home ownership mythology that you buy a home, it automatically goes up in value every year. You can use it as a cash ATM whenever you need money, and then you will live happily ever after. This Buy Your Own Home program was instituted in, say, 1918 by Herbert Hoover before he was even president. Um, they created this whole idea that if we can get Americans trapped in their neighborhoods, they will be more protective of their property, more interested in local politics, more interested in national politics. So I would contend, I didn't talk about it today, I talk about it a lot in the book, that the government has fostered this idea that home ownership is, um, it's, it's not only a good financial decision, but it's good for your country. And that's why every president, certainly every modern president, George W. Bush, H.W. Bush, Clinton, you name it, they all have this idea that everybody needs to own their own home. And so I think government has fostered this idea of trapping people in this situation for, for many years. Um, second question. The normal cost nature of uh, the housing market, the mortgage in the United States, why would that happen? Because other jurisdictions, like for example, like Hong Kong, cannot just walk away. Why would somebody walk away if, if there, it is not in recourse? Is that the question? <laughs> yeah. Um, because lenders, if they don't think they'll have much to get from your other assets, may make the business decision not to chase you for your additional assets. And so that is a chance you're taking. So you're going to have a deficiency. Let's say you have a deficiency of 50,000, 100,000, and you walk away. They're going to probably hang a judgment on you for that amount. And big banks are not all that good at, um, at, uh, at collecting. They're a lot better at getting the money out the door very indiscriminately, as I think Professor Hoffman pointed out in, in, his, in his talk today. But they have every, um, have every incentive creating money out of nowhere to do as much of it as possible and not necessarily uh, be as careful as you should when you're lending them money. So on the collection side, they may, if they determine that, okay, it's going to take me 50,000 50, to collect this, if I'm chasing 100,000 and I think the guy's got a boat and I think the guy's, I think uh, his wife has a uh, <coughs> box of jewelry, et cetera, et cetera, then they may have something to chase. If, if everything is tied up in a person's home, they may walk away. But the other issue is they may sell that judgment. So anybody who does this has to be aware that even if they get a judgment, a big, slow, stupid bank may not be chasing them. Some very enterprising judgment buyer who bought the $50,000 judgment for $1,000 may pop up somewhere in their, later, in their life later saying, you know, um, let's make a deal, uh, and they may be very nimble and very, uh, uh, very aggressive. But um, for non-recourse states, it's a, it's a much easier decision. Recourse states, it's a much trickier prospect. And um, that's why I say walking away from people, you don't walk away scot free. There's threats there. Um, there's costs associated. Professor Douglas. No, Professor Howard. And you said what? No, I, I think you said Professor Howard. Everything she watches. He's German from the US. Again, I have questions like French. Even after answering both questions, I'm still not persuaded with your, with your uh, remarks. And I think you are perfectly right when you describe it from a positive uh, perspective. Well, how people behave and why do they behave this way, not another way. But you jump to ethics very easily, and you justified uh, some of some of this, uh, this behavior, part of patterns. Mm -hmm. And I must say that you know uh, I'm afraid that you're opening a Pandora box, uh, and uh, which will destroy the libertarian concept of contract and of property as well, because you know 
personally decided not to, not to, to walk away because of many reasons. Because uh, the house is simply gets uh, like lots of water in the basement during springs, or maybe the plumbing system doesn't work properly, and he may decide just to walk away because it doesn't. It's not as good as, as he thought it would be, and uh, I think it's not a reasonable reason actually to, to walk away from a contract to, to justify it. And if we go further, you know, of course, from a positive point of view. If you find a bicycle in the, in the street and uh, nobody sees it, you may take a bicycle and this would be a business decision, you know, we run away with a bicycle. But it doesn't mean that we have to justify this, this kind of business decision. Uh, it, it, it's com simply a completely different area. And I think that comparison to taxation or social welfare and, and, and social security is not correct actually. Because in case of banks, you sign a contract. In case of taxation, you need contracts not existing and so social security as well. And in fact, if you look to the, the, the pra practicalities, in many cases it's a person who applies for credit to buy a house. It's not the bank who forces it. And just for the final remark, I, uh, it's a favorite example from, from UK. Uh, there, there was a case with, with, a, with a lady who sued a bank uh, because she thought the bank actually seduced her by offering uh, extended credit uh, and actually the offer was made exactly on the day when she lost her job. And of course the, the, the offer was put in a very nice manner, like please go and spend all of it. And actually he, she did uh, during next week. And then after having uh, no money to, to, to pay back the credit, she sued the bank for, because the bank seduced her. And actually she won. And, and, and I think that this is a very dangerous path. Uh, don't, don't you afraid of, of going this path so, so quickly? Well, this is what makes for a good Q&A, I suppose. But, uh, boy, no laughs on my hair, boy. It's a tough, tough crowd. Um, no, in terms of taxation, you decide whether you would pay income tax, right? Yes? Yeah. You decide that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you decide not to pay. And from ethical point of view, and as it is it ethical for you not to pay taxes? Sure. And is it ethical? And, and if, I mean, when you say that, well, we get taxed, and that's not equivalent to a mortgage, because you voluntarily got into a mortgage, well, you voluntarily signed on to pay income tax when you got a job, when you make income. You voluntarily, you voluntarily sign on to pay property taxes when you own property. You voluntarily sign on to pay sales tax when you buy things. Okay, sit over there in the ivory tower if you want to. I'm talking about the real world here. And what I'm trying to talk about is the real world versus this libertarian nirvana. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that, well, in principle, you are right. A contract is a contract, but it's not always that easy uh, to just say that a contract is a contract. A few years ago, I had an exchange with Philip. Uh, we, were, we were talking about possible monetary deflation in the current monetary system. So let's suppose that like most of the banks they collapse and, and uh, nominally your debt goes like thousand percent up if all, most of the banks fail. So under the circumstances, well, we would need a sort of arrangement uh, for the whole country to reorganize the debt structure, right? But then from your perspective, uh, you could just say, well, you took the credit. It's your risk. You're supposed to just pay, pay the whole debt to me, right? Pay, pay to the bank. And the current uh, legal system actually benefits the banks hugely. So it's like, uh, let's say in 1991, when you had one company, one company providing telephone services. Okay, so let's say the telephone service, uh, the company comes in in 1991, offers you a contract. Sign it or otherwise, you're not going to have a fall. Okay. And you sign a contract saying, okay, I will be your customer for the next 100 years or until I die. And then in 15 years, suddenly you have market economy developed, you have competition between uh, different companies, so you can choose a different company, but then you're not allowed to because you have a sort of contract. Right? It's like the state would show up at your door and say, you want to pay the taxes, right? No, but sign a contract now. No, I will not. Okay, so you're not allowed on the public street and die in your home, right? And then they could defend themselves by saying that well, the state is a voluntary institution. You signed a contract, not didn't you, right? 
And you would have to sign the contract under the circumstances, right? Admit that you would, right? Wouldn't you sign the contract? You would die out of hunger. But the situation is completely different. I know, I know. It's not completely. It is different. You are right. It's different, but it's not completely different. It's the question of, of continuum, right? When do you draw the borderline, right? And that's up to the debate, and I think that was what was being also, made for me. What, 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 what we marvel at, I think it, it is very important that you look at each specific case, so to speak. Um, let's say uh, I go to Bernanke and, uh, and he gives me a huge loan. Uh, not as a private person, but as the head of the central bank. Um, do I then have the obligation to repay the loan or can I default on the loan and, and walk away? Um, would he be treated in the legal system in the same way as if I received the loan from you personally? Um, and yeah, I would say, of course, if I default on Bernanke, then it's perfectly all right. Uh, after all, he is the head of a criminal organization. Um, I have no moral obligation whatsoever to pay anything back to him. It depends, so to speak, on the status of uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac or whatever his American name is. So, um, um, how we would categorize them. Uh, so, I think all we can agree on is each individual case has to be examined. Uh, after all, uh, each individual case would, could also be brought to court. They have to look at the facts of the case and then determine whether this would be under libertarian law, so to speak, okay or would not be okay. I'm, I'm sure that, that you agree that uh, Bernanke, uh, that I don't have the same obligation to Bernanke as I would have to you personally. Carrying, uh, carrying on with uh, central bank balance sheets, uh, and uh, this is for uh, Philip and Matus. This is not an ethical question. It's just about uh, history or about the future. You can take it either way. So central bank balance sheets. Um, something that's fairly likely to happen in the next few years is that measured core consumer inflation will eventually start to pick up like our headline inflation measured consumer inflation has already picked up dramatically and when this happens the Fed will probably start doing a tightening and that tightening may very well include uh, kind of a reverse QE2 where they um, take their balance sheet and squeeze it down. Now, if they do this in a undoubtedly higher interest rate environment, they're going to take huge losses on that balance sheet. They're going to be selling treasuries and mortgage backs um, uh, you know, in maybe an environment in which the, uh, the average interest rate on the treasury curve is is uh, six rather than uh, two or three. <coughs> My question to you is, well, it's, it's a bunch of questions about does it matter ultimately? Do you know of historical cases or cases right now where central bank losses, potential losses, are already constraining so-called independent monetary policy? where the central bankers are trying to protect their own institutions because even though they're really part of the state, they also have their own personal agendas. And if they lose a ton of money, they've got to go, do they have to go? Do they have to go to the treasury and get a recapitalization? Or can they just bury it with good old, um, cost accounting, where they just, but they can't hear it right because they're selling bonds. If they actually sell the bonds, 
um, to uh, uh, contract uh, the, the base, they're going to actually have to record losses. So you can approach this from either a historical, like has central banks been constrained by their own P&L, or in the future, will the U.S. constrained? Is China being constrained? We have a lot of central banks now with huge balance sheets uh, with uh, tremendous potential losses. You're right that the uh, Fed, at least, okay, of course, don't, cannot be insolvent in the sense that it cannot pay its debts because it can just produce uh, dollars to, to pay its debts. Um, but it's to have a negative capital on the balance sheet would be problematic for the confidence uh, in the currency. They would have losses, and it would, have, would make would be obvious that there are not many real not many real assets left to defend the currency in case of problems or for monetary reform or for, for that matter. However, because when they sell assets with losses, it becomes obvious that there was nothing or there's nothing left to do a monetary reform or to intervene on the foreign exchange markets to defend the currency, etc. So. It might have an um, important effect on the confidence and people might yeah, start to sell uh, the currency or their, their dollars. And um, you see it also that it matters for the ECB, because the ECB of course can also print its, its euros. However, in December they increased their capital. Why? Because they are of, of course expecting losses from their adventures and Club Med, and um, they won't. They don't want to have negative capital. So, so, and this has costs for them because it reduces their profits. And they pay back less uh, less profits to governments due to this capital increase. So they they care. They actually care for their balance sheet. And of course, there are cases of central banks, or the central bank of Iceland, for example. It based, uh, it went uh, basically insolvent because it has had debts in foreign currencies, but no, it didn't really nominate the uh, foreign currencies. So there it's, it's uh, even more relevant. But of course, for the ECB and the Fed, it's not so much relevant because they don't have so many uh, foreign nominated uh, debts. I would say that uh, it doesn't really matter whether they have negative capital or not. The central banks could easily do what they're doing still, even if they would have, uh, even if they had uh, negative capital. Uh, the the guess would be probably well, the economists would have, the, the accountants at the bank would have a problem probably. But uh, what they would probably do, you're right, they would go to treasury or uh, get the extra money. The government would have to buy money in the in the financial market. Uh, they would issue new debt to recapitalize the central bank, and then uh, that extra debt would be bought again by the central bank or something like that. So, uh, what they would have to do is just increase public debt, but this, of course, doesn't matter under the circumstances because the public debt would be just rolled over, as, as Philip demonstrated. So, uh, I don't think there is any problem with, uh, with, um, with negative, negative capital for uh, for the central bank. It might be problematic for smaller countries. Might be provided for small countries, but not for ECB or uh, or the Federal Reserve System. I, I don't see any problem coming here. And uh, apart from that, I don't think also that the balance sheet per se is that important for uh, the strength of the currency. Uh, I think other factors are more important. The investors are not really paying attention to capitalization of the central bank. They're not really paying attention to uh, what are the currency reserves. Of so it actually argues the other way that, that, the, uh, that the value of currency depends on the on the quality of the balance <coughs> sheet, and uh, we'll soon see verification of, of these hypotheses, I guess. If I may add, so of course the capital of uh, banks is central banks is completely fictitious. Huh? Uh, this is not the result of an economic productive activity. 
So it's very easy for government to recapitalize the central bank. The central bank just buys all of the treasuries, and the government does not spend the money, but put it in this special account called capital reserves in the central bank. So this can be a cashless operation. The recapitalization of central banks to any given level is purely cashless. But uh, your question has a particular relevance for the euro area, and the reason is the following. Uh, any profits from the monetary operations that uh, Philip detailed are redistributed. But any losses are kept on the specific central bank which provided emergency liquidity assistance. Now we are having this issue currently because uh, Irish banks uh, uh, are borrowing almost as much as they borrow from the regular operations directly from their central bank, these emergency loans. And whatever losses could be realized on these emergency loans would go directly from the state. Then, of course, this would increase the cost of borrowing of the Irish state even more. Uh, and so there is a kind of socialization of profits uh, within uh, member states of the euro area, but there is individual uh, individualization of possible losses. And this would, in the long term, uh, bring actually further conflict within uh, European states. Um, yeah, yeah, we, we are here with different op opinions. Um, just, just one example. Imagine that the Fed gets negative capital because they do an audit and they find there's no gold. So it takes a loss, there's no gold in the Fed, okay, negative capital. Or you do the recapitalization, which is just a cashless uh, transaction. Would nothing happen to the dollar? I, I, I would doubt it. I would doubt it. Because uh, they, then it becomes obvious that there's no, no real asset to uh, as, a, as a result there. But we, of course, we, we can see in Paris. <laughs> if somebody shot for that, he also thought he would have to tolerate the Ferrari problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is a question for Professor Hoppe. Um Given the, the parasites and the Kind of thieves that has taken over, is the government has taken over all these countries. I know the idiots in the academia and the journalists that would go along with them and create these stupid theories that uh, rob more people of more of their property. From a competitive position of the lovers of liberty, what is the strategy to benefit from this? I mean, if, if we are trying to compete against them and create something as an alternative, all these bags are actually goods in terms of creating something alternative that would attract some of the people that don't want to be voluntary serfs anymore. So, my, I guess my, the first part of the question is why hasn't anything like this happened yet? And the whole world is dominated by this parasite national nation states. And second, what, what can we do about it to make it less likely that it will continue like this in the future? Progress in terms of 
three months. In some interview recently, he has been everything go better. Yes, of course, technologically, everything got better. I would not want to live in the 19th century then. Um, but in terms of personal liberties, uh, I think people in the 19th century, of course, had far more personal liberties than they have, than they have currently. So, Maybe somebody has to say something more optimistic, but uh, I'm not one of those that has great optimism. This is why I think this is also a sort of to joy each other's company and, and laugh about the foolishness of the world. <laughs> no, I think I think that I quoted Gary North last year here uh, on this question and uh, there's a saying in America that you cannot fight City Hall. City Hall will do whatever it wants to you. But Gary Gore says, but you can pee on the front steps and run away. That's, that's a lot of what you do. <laughs> Just to say that uh, there are four more people on this report, 16 minutes. Or something. Yeah, is that all right? Oh, okay. So I'd like to pick up on uh, Paul Godfrey's question. Uh, uh, answer to that, that uh, we can't say that because of welfare state, we, that's the reason why, we have, why we've had the progress that we've had. Uh, I'd like to put, just make a few assertions that uh, really to the question. Uh, I would observe that the lifetime tax rate Nowadays, higher than what the taxation was, it was because of private slaves, I would say, yes, it is 
higher than what was imposed on private slaves. Uh, again, I'm sure there exist empirical studies about this. I'm not an expert on this. I only vaguely remember having read uh, comparisons of current tax rates and the degree of exploitation that uh, the slaves were subject to. And, uh, and the answer is clearly um, that uh, the, the amount of taxes, so to speak, extracted from the slave was low as compared to what is extracted from, uh, from people nowadays. But Tom might be looking at it. I remember reading something by Paul Craig Roberts. He said medieval serfs uh, paid something like 40%. And in the U.S. anyway, if you, if you were to get statistics on tax revenues from all levels of government and divide by national income, you'd get uh, over 40 percent. But that doesn't count the inflation tax or how regulation causes the price of goods and services to go up and all the other effects of government that are really implicit taxes. And so, uh, so if Craig Roberts is right, uh, then yeah, at least the average American pays far more than medieval serf. Market, 
or just another state where you scroll it into a different name. Uh, and in order to have a quality currency merging, you need at least a critical mass of people that are willing to that understand the advantages of a commodity money and willing to deal only with other people who accept a commodity money. And probably we are not there yet. But what we are still seeing is that some foreign central banks are increasingly buying gold. Uh, and uh, more and more skeptical about uh, Western and American public debt instruments as investment opportunities. But I think that the UK loans right now are not really essential. Are really important. I think they are very important the moment you go off, for example, gold standard, and then you say dollars will be legal tender for all, for the old debt. But I would think right now it would not make have a huge effect if illegal tender would sort of be eliminated because just the size of the state is so big and for taxes you need dollars. So it, it might be important, the abolition of the legal tender laws might actually be important if you also introduce uh, competition in the banking industry, right? Uh, then it would have a tremendous effect, actually, if it, the banks would spontaneously develop. Even in the alternative currency, if you just leave the central banking system with currently existing fiat monies and licensing of the banks for this particular currency, even if you leave this, because if you introduce competition, completely free competition, nobody will trust the banks anymore, they will collapse. Uh, but even if you, if you left that system alone and then uh, abolish the, the legal tender laws and introduce a form of competition in, in uh, other currencies and, and freedom of banking services in other currencies, I would think it would, it, it would make a huge difference. It could make a huge difference.